Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three. The top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 30th, 2018. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The Michael Duke Show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 9 to 11 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 9.15 to 10 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, as we wait on the SB 26 conference committee to meet, a very interesting new look by Ed King at King Economics Group at the legislature's proposed POMV draw rates. Like an earlier piece we did, he is suggesting that the draw rates are being set too low, artificially reducing both the PFD and the amount going to government. Second, another look at HB 331, the proposal to issue bonds to fund accelerating the payment of the outstanding oil credit balances. We look at what the effect of that is on future Alaskans, something we don't think has gotten a lot of attention. And third, a swing over to the federal side and some questions we have for our congressional delegation about what they are doing to deal with the rapidly growing national debt. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley joins us every week to discuss oil, gas, and the economic forecast of Alaska. It's the Michael Dukes Show. Every week... Brad Keithley, who is a former oil and gas consultant and attorney, comes in. He now runs the Alaskans for Sustainable Budget organization. And that is, of course, a organization dedicated to sustainable budgets for Alaska. Pretty self-explanatory. He's a pretty straightforward guy. And that's what we like to do. I guess we bring him on here and try this over here. Good morning, Brad. How are you doing? Michael, I'm doing great this morning. How about you? You know what? Um... Okay. I guess that's all I can say this morning. A little bit okay. I uh, feel like somebody dropped a truck on me. Other than that, it's uh, we're good to go. So let's uh, let's get down to it. You've got your weekly top three, and uh, I think that there's no time to waste because we, we're we down into it. We're, got, we're down to the final days, and there's really a couple big things in front of us at the state legislative level. One, of course, uh, and I think the big elephant in the room that – that everybody really is concerned about from a personal standpoint is SB 26, which deals specifically with um, with the uh, uh, POMV change and potentially a change in our future permanent fund dividend payouts. And uh, that's where you want to start out your weekly top three. It is. Uh, SB 26 uh, is a proposal uh, originated in the Senate, went over to the House, House added a bunch to it, came back to the Senate, now in conference committee. It's a proposal that would do essentially two things. Uh, the House wants to add a third, but it doesn't look like the conferees are moving in that direction right now. The two things are that it would adopt uh, percent of market value, or POMV, uh, as as the me- mechanism that controls uh, the, the draw on the permanent fund earnings reserve um, into uh, into both the PFD and into government. It would it would replace essentially uh, the mechanism that's currently there in the statute called statutory net earnings or statutory net income, uh, and replace that with a POMB draw from the from the earnings account. Um, that that's one thing. The second thing it does, which is separate from the first, sometimes they get confused. But the second thing that SB 26 would do, uh, coming from both bodies is it would change the percent of the of the draw that goes to the PFD and goes to government from that from what's in the current statute. In the current statute, basically the statute contemplates a 50-50 share, uh, 50% of the earnings stream coming from the permanent fund going to the PFD, 
the other 50% going to government, but there's a portion in there that goes to inflation proofing. So actually government ends up with significantly less than 50% under the current statute. The, the, both the House and the Senate changed that percentage. Uh, the House uh, percentage is uh, 33% to the PFD, 67% to government. Um, and the Senate proposal is 25, as, as SB 26 originally came up, was 25% uh, to, uh, uh, to the PFD and 75% uh, to government. And then the third thing that the House proposed uh, when they came back uh, with their version of SB 26 was an income tax uh, as an additional revenue measure to make up the remainder of the budget deficit uh, that is there because of current spending levels. It doesn't look like the conferees are going uh, down that direction. The, uh, the, 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 indi the indicators we've seen thus far, the request for uh, limited free conference powers, which uh, the conferees requested, didn't include the tax section, so it looks like that's likely to be stricken. So the, the real discussion going on right now appears to be about the first two. Do we go to a POMV? And there's a sub question inside that one, which is what's the percent we use of draw? Uh, and then the second is how do we break that? Uh, how do we break that apart between the uh, between the permanent fund dividend and uh, and government? Let's talk for a minute about POMV, because I've been very leery of this idea. This is actually part of the idea that was floated back in 1999 that went in front of an advisory vote of the citizens of the state, and it was voted down 82 percent with something like a 67 percent voter turnout. Uh, it was voted down like 82 and a half percent by the people. Uh, I've been very leery of a POMV uh, in part because of that. Uh, but you've said it, this really kind of plays into the POMV change itself is not a bad thing that it kind of plays into the Hammond 50 50 plan. But the question, of course, the devil's in the details of getting it to the right percentage points. Am I, am I right? Am I reading your, your take right on this? No, you're exactly, you're exactly right. POM, POMV is, is really just another way of doing inflation of doing inflation proofing the way the current statute handles inflation proofing and, and inflation proofing is the amount that you leave back in in the permanent fund each year to account for inflation. So the so there isn't the the the, the amount that's in the permanent fund doesn't doesn't decline due to due to not grow it doesn't doesn't grow doesn't decline as a result of not growing to keep rate right with inflation if that if that makes any sense. Um, the way the current statute does it is uh, on the government's fifty percent side. There's 50% going to the PFD, but on the government's 50% side, the statute requires that a portion of that 50% be redistributed back into uh, uh, the permanent fund corpus in order to keep the corpus whole for uh, for inflation proofing. And, and that amount is not insubstantial. For the last few years, it's been about 25% of, the, of, of, the, of that 50% going to government, about half of the amount going to government. Uh, and so that reduces the amount available to government to about to about 25%. You, you need to inflation proof. I, there's problems with the, with the current statute and the amount and the way it determines inflation proofing, but you need to do inflation proofing in some amount. Um, and, but, but the current statute does that. The, the, the challenge with the current statute is because it takes it entirely out of the government's 50%, government doesn't get the other 50% that I think Hammond originally contemplated, they're only getting about 25% because a big chunk of that's going to inflation proofing. And as a consequence, because government doesn't get that much, it is that that's a that's a, a motivator to cut the PFD to create more money for government or to raise taxes. What POMB does is is sort of the same thing. It inflation proofs in a different way, but it inflation proofs evenly. Uh, between both the PFD portion and the government's portion, so that so that both portions are paying their fair share, if you will, um, of inflation through uh, inflation proofing through POMB. So POMB in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's just a different way, and frankly, when you look at the numbers, it's a slightly better way of doing inflation proofing uh, over over what the current statute's done. 
Now, when you get down to it, there, of course, the the scary part of this whole thing. I mean, setting aside and assuming what you're saying about POMV is is accurate and correct, and we could find a, a good POMV way to make it happen. The scary part here was that not only did they want to change the POMV, not only did or to it POMV, not only did they want to change to it, not only did they want a very skewed percentage somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 30, but on top of that, they were talking about modifying the way the permanent fund dividend itself was being paid and putting a cap on it, some some temporarily, some permanently. Any word on that component of the bill? Is that gone? Or are we just stuck on the POMV now and the percentage? Uh, any word on on whether or not the, somebody's going to try and resurrect that that change to the permanent fund for future generations? Well, there's 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 a lot of things in in both bills. I mean, there's both bills contain minimums, minimum uh, PFDs, which I think is a problem in the other direction. Um, and then both bills contain the the cap. Uh, that results from uh, from the percentage drop. Uh, the The latest thing that some people have have speculated on, or there's been rumors about coming out of the conference committee, is is a hybrid resolution that would adopt POMV uh, for determining the amount of the draw, which frankly I think is a is probably a good thing depends on the percentage we need to talk about that in a moment but uh, adopts POMV to determine the draw uh, but keeps in place the current statute uh, as a way of determining what the PFD uh, would would be and, and and so you've got one one mechanism working to determine what the draw rate is, what the what the amount coming out of the permanent fund is available for to be split between government uh, and the PFD, and then you've got a second entirely different mechanism that's that's predicated on the old system of statutory net income that would be that would be ostensibly determining the uh, the amount of the permanent fund dividend. Sort of the 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 justification for those two is a political justification. It is basically um, we get POMV, we tell people that we kept the current statute in place. Maybe that convinces them not to pursue uh, a referendum on the on the combined result. Uh, maybe that if they do pursue it, maybe it doesn't get them enough votes. Maybe we that gives us enough arguments to defeat it uh, in the fall. But it's all a political calculation. We say we didn't change the current statute. The the problem from from a fiscal standpoint is it doesn't work. The, the two mechanisms don't work. Uh, if you go to a POMB at 5%, um, you, in order to fund the current dividend, you'd have to take about 60% of the combined draw. You're no longer at 50-50. So it's, it's a mechanism that has a political genesis to it, uh, but is, is, is one that from a fiscal standpoint uh, just sends us further downhill. Basically, it sets up a system where the next legislature um, says, wait a second, <laughs> you've gone to POMV, you're limiting the draw, you've told us that we're supposed to observe the current PFD statute, but that would mean 60% of it would go to the PFD. We can't afford that, so we'll just ignore it. We'll continue to ignore the PFD statute uh, the way we've been doing. It would it would give them a political argument, but not a but not a fiscal fix. Which, um, I guess this is the danger that we talked about, that if they bump up against this May the 10th deadline, um, it gives us a problem with any kind of political referendum because uh, by statute, there has to be 180 days between the actual general election and the filing of referendum. And if they move beyond May the 10th, then they would not be able to do that until the next cycle, which means that we would be almost two years away from any kind of referendum. Uh, now, I would see that as political suicide uh, for anybody that decided to push beyond that simply because people are already outraged. Uh, now, whether or not they could keep ahead of steam on that outrage for longer than a year or two is, a, I guess, a question for deeper political thinkers than I am. But I think it would be a mistake. I think the backlash in this election alone might be enough to dissuade them from that. What are your thoughts? And are you hearing anything different on that? Well, that's that's the that's the reason, uh, frankly, that that this hybrid is is showing up. I mean, I think there has been a lot of pushback. Uh, on the PFD, I think there has been a lot of a, a lot of a lot of 
outrage, a lot of uh, 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 comments, emails, calls to the legislator, to various legislators about that. And I think that's the reason that they're coming up with this hybrid with, that would permit them to say, well, we didn't change the stat, we didn't change the PFD statute. It's still there the same way it's always been. Uh, we just did. We just we just tinkered with the with the way in which we calculate the revenues coming in, right. uh, coming out of the permanent fund in, into into the general fund. But we didn't change the the ultimate statute. And you know, the first argument would be there's nothing to have a referendum on. We didn't change the statute. The statute's right there. Look at it. Still there in the books. We didn't amend it. Um, and, and but that would, would that, say, that would not that would not stop anybody from putting a referendum bill on the POMV change, right? Because that's also in statute. It it that's right. Uh, but you've got a you've got a harder you've got a <laughs> you you got to explain a lot then about about what POMV is doing, and frankly, uh, because I'm a, a, a in favor of, of of POMV if it's done the right way, you'd have a split in the PFD camp about, uh, about what to do, about how to respond to that statute. So it's, um, they're trying, yes, there's, they, they, I think they've heard the pushback on cutting the PFD. Uh, and, and, and this hybrid is a way of trying to, uh, and run, uh, uh, that pushback in a way that, uh, that, that gives them cover as they go into the election. So um, noodle it out for me. What happens if we get this hybrid, which you said doesn't really work? Um, you know what? What uh, you know? So what happens if it does pass the way that you're presupposing that it does? Well, I, I think we've got a mess on our hands. I mean, that's the comment I've made uh, as I've seen this thing unfold that it creates a mess, um, and it's it's not it's not a fiscal solution. It is. It is an unworkable political solution uh, that, and, and we've seen how that's fared. I mean, it keeps the current PFD in place, and we've seen how that's fared over the last two legislatures or last two sessions. The governor uh, uh, cut it uh, one year, and then the and then the legislature cut it the next. And is and 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 at the same time as they be preserving the statute, they've got an operating budget that cuts it again this year. Right. Uh, it's a they're they're tr they're trying to thread a needle in a way that um, uh, that's politically expedient, uh, but fiscally uh, uh, completely uh, unsound. <laughs> where, where does it go? Where, where does it go if they pass it? it uh, there probably will be an effort to to undo the POMB portion uh, by uh, by by referendum. Uh, but that's just going to be a very – it's going to be as murky as the statute they just passed. Uh, 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 and and, I, and in all honesty, I don't know where that goes. Well, I mean, this is uh, – you know, this is the, – the fiscal irresponsibility seems to have been running rampant in the legislature, well, for about 10 years now. I mean, we just keep going uh, in the same direction, and, and uh, it's like we're pouring – it's like we're pouring more uh, oil on the fire uh, completely all the time here. <laughs> Um, so there, we're, there, there, there's one other piece. There's one other piece. I don't want to layer too many in here. Um, uh, cause I, as you often say, I get into the weeds enough as it is, but there's one other piece that we, that we ought to, uh, 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 mention as we, as we think about this total picture, it makes a big difference in POMV, what percentage you use. The the discussion uh, uh, has has thus far been around in the range of 5.25 percent uh, annual draw uh, down to four as low as 4.75 percent, and that's been the range that people talked talked about. The the rumors about the conference committee is that they're going to come out with basically the sentence approach, which is 5.25 percent for a couple of years maybe, and then and then step down to five percent. But but what you're trying to do with that percentage is you're trying to replicate the real rate of return, the 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 after inflation rate of return that you're getting out of the permanent fund. Here here's the problem with that. The permanent fund historically has earned about a six percent real rate of return, and so if you only pull five percent uh, out of the permanent fund. You're leaving more behind. You're leaving more earnings behind in the permanent fund uh, than 
then you should. Uh, then I think what Hammond, the Governor Hammond contemplated uh, when he set up the, per- the permanent fund draw. And, and you shortchange the current generation. You shortchange both the current PFD and the current amount going to government. Um, uh, you're building up the PFD into, into a, a bigger number for future generations, but you're shortchanging the current generation, and you're, you're leaving essentially money on the table from the standpoint of the current, current generation. A guy, uh, Ed King, uh, who's the, uh, the head of a group called King Economics Group, has done a recent piece that we've had posted on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budget Facebook page if people want to dig down into it, that really went into that issue uh, in, in, I think, a, a, a different and, and important way. And, and the way he evaluated uh, the, uh, the, the issue is, is if we use a 5% draw rate, what does that result in 20 years? Right. Um, looking looking forward 20 years and the question is or 30 years the question is uh do you end up with you know a a pfd of about or a permanent fund of about 80 billion dollars which is what we should have if you take the current pf the current permanent fund and and inflate it over time inflation proof it do you end up with that or do you end up with a number that's bigger or smaller if you end up with a number that's bigger than that 80 billion dollars what you've done is you've saved too much. You've, you've not drawn as much as you could, uh, and you've shortchanged the current generation. If you end up with a number smaller than, than $80 billion and roughly that amount, uh, you've shortchanged the future generation. You've drained more money out currently uh, than, uh, than you should, uh, and you've shortchanged the future generation. He did an analysis of, of where you end up, both under the current law and SB 26, and under SB 26, his analysis was that in 30 years, 40 years, we end up with a permanent fund value of $200 billion, <laughs> inflation adjusted, <laughs> compared, to the 80, compared to the 80 billion, which is roughly where we should be. And so what that tells you is we've way oversaved, uh, that the permanent fund has earned a lot more um, uh, over that time frame then has been distributed out in permanent fund dividend and in uh, earnings. That the 5% draw rate uh, that he used in doing this analysis is too low, and you shortchanged the current generation. So there's another issue that the conference committee is not getting to, but frankly, it's an issue that we'll be talking about uh, once the conference committee comes up with something and, and, and publishes it. It's an it's a, it's a issue we'll be talking about about whether we've got the POMV rate right. If, we're, if, if we don't have it right, if we set it too low, or if we set it too high, uh, if we don't have it right, we're shortchanging uh, one generation or the other. And it's really, especially as we look at it from the current generation, uh, if we shortchange this generation, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut the PFD more than we need to. We're also gonna shortchange government on what its share of the earnings should be and that's going to increase the pressure on cutting the PFD further or on going to taxes. So it's very important to get this number right. Uh, and the analysis, this is, a, this is a great analysis, and it's a great analysis tool that uh, Ed King has developed. Uh, what this analysis tells you is that we, is that we are not at the right number. Uh, 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 either the House nor the Senate is at the right number as they're going through the current considerations. And so as people would like to say, all right, Mr. Smarty Pants, so what is the right number? That's the that's the question. No. <sighs> we we did we did an analysis a couple of weeks ago and looked at the historic rates of return, uh, real rates of return uh, from the uh, uh, from the permanent fund, and found that regardless of whether you use an average of the return, real rate of return from the beginning of the fund, or 25 years, or 20 years, or 15 years, or 10 years, or five years. The average rate of return that the permanent fund uh, has earned, real rate of return, is in the neighborhood of six percent plus, six, like six and a quarter. Um, so that's the that's historically what the permanent fund's been able to earn. People use five percent because they like to be conservative, and they like to say, "Well, you know, there might be years when we're down or years when we're up." Well, when you look at the array uh, back over you know, multiple years of what the permanent funds earned. Yes, there's been years it's been down. Yes, there's been years it's been up. 
but the average over that time has been about has been a little bit above above six uh, percent. So a percent on sixty billion dollars um, uh, that is you know six hundred million dollars. That's three hundred million dollars that we're shortchanging the permanent fund um, and uh, and shortchanging government and leading government to think they need taxes or, or permanent fund dividends. So I think the right way to look at this, as we did in this piece a few weeks ago, is to look at it on a historical average. Ed looks at it a different way. And he comes to around six percent. Also, that's the number that I think we ought to be looking at. If you if you don't do that, if you use five percent instead, then you end up saving a lot for the future, uh, but shortchanging this generation and uh, and making our lives in this generation more difficult than they need to be. All right. So that is SB twenty six. We're going to be watching closely. Um, uh, what kills me on this, Brad, is that, and I had this whole rant yesterday about the fact that they're holding all these things behind closed doors. There's really been no substantive discussion in the public eye, no transparency, none of this. I mean, what we had here was a deeper analysis of POMV and the changes and challenges under SB 26 than anything we've had from the legislature themselves. There's really been almost no discussion uh, on this as a whole, especially in the conference committee. And um, hopefully... Uh, we find some way to, to to minimize the damage of what they're about to do. And I don't know if we can or not, but uh, that's uh, that's the big point. That's talking point number one, which leads us over to the other thing, which, of course, is the legislature is very good at this. And that is, of course, kicking the can down the road. Um, they really don't like to pay their due when it's come due. They'd rather, in fact, send it to somebody else. And so... Here we have the oil tax credits, and they don't want to pay it on the statutory deadline. Oh, no, we can't follow the statutes at all. What they want to do is bond and borrow money to pay it all off at once and then kick those payments down the road uh, for future generations. Uh, This is rife with problems. I mean, I could see it just as a consumer how that might not be a good idea. You've got some deeper analysis on it, though. Well, so so the theory behind that is look uh these credits are going to produ- are going to result in additional oil production we hope and so let's kick the the payment on these credits down to the time that we have additional oil production um and 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 additional revenues that result from that the problem is the problem with that's two things one the revenues aren't as high as as they're trying to tell themselves they are at least not according to the department of revenues projections uh, down the, the revenues down the road aren't as high as they try to are trying to tell themselves they are. But two, we've already done that once, and that we've done it with PERS and TERS. The way the way that we resolved PERS and TERS back in 2014 is we did two things, and and this was this was to make the costs look smaller in the current day, so we could spend more on other things, particularly capital budgets, spend more on other things um, instead of uh, spending it on putting money into PERS and TERS. And so what they did is they took $3 billion out of the Constitutional Budget Reserve and they transferred it over to PERS and TERS. Okay, <coughs> that, that's that's sort of a, a big chunk of advance payment. Got that, uh, and, uh, and and that's fine. But then what they, the other thing they did is they went to a methodology of, of how they're going to make the annual contributions on PERS and TERS going forward that looks a lot like uh, a slide going up. Uh, it's an escalated number that escalates, frankly, at, at like 6% per year, and that's a very conservative estimation, but escalates at 6% per year going forward. So they, in 2014, they took these big PERS and TERS numbers, reduced them in the current year, but put them on this escalator that, that starts clipping along at about 400,000 to 500,000 to 600, excuse me, 400 million to 500 million to 600 million. Um, by the time you get to the 2020s and the 2030s, they've art, they kicked that can down the road. And that's a big chunk of, of spending that's staring us in the face uh, out there in the future. I did an analysis that I posted up yesterday on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page, and that's about 15 percent of our revenues, a little under 15 percent of our revenues uh, that are going to go to PERS and TERS. Uh, in 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027, that's that's a huge chunk of revenue. When when you think of of you know all the things, all the spending programs we got going on. 
So they've already done this. They've already right. they've already kicked one can down the road. Well, and and, and can I all, can can I hit you on that sure. just for a second, Brad? Because we uh, I I did some my own deeper analysis on this last week after you, I had you on the program, and and the problem is their plan, as you said, was that hockey stick escalation at the end. But they have not even been able to hold to their own timeline, to their own deadline. In 10 years, their annual required payment, the ACR that they're supposed to pay into that, they have only hit that number two out of 10 years. Two times out of 10 years were they able to hit that target number of their annual contribution re- requirement. Uh, and that, I mean, they, they can't even do it now. And they want to kick it down the road further. Uh, they ignore the statutes when they feel like anyway. It just seems like this is just again pouring gasoline on the fire. Yeah, it's that number. The, the number we're looking at, the staring at in the mid twenties, is very conservative. A reason for that, one as, as you're just talking about, a reason for that is it assumes that the that the investment fund that they've built up that's supposed to be generating returns uh, to help pay for these. Uh, pay for the person tourist costs is going to generate an eight percent return. <laughs> um, the, the investment fund has not done that. I mean, that's what you were just talking about. It, the investment fund has not generated those eight percent returns. If it doesn't generate those eight percent returns, we have to up the annual contribution to make up for that. We have to we have to redo the formula uh, to make up for that. So when you look at these numbers for the mid twenties. That that have you know nearly fifteen percent of revenues going to purse and tourists. That's extremely conservative because if we don't hit that eight percent mark, and as you just said, uh, we haven't done it. We've only done it three out of the last ten years. If we don't hit that eight percent mark. Those numbers have to go up uh, in order to make up for uh, for the shortfall that's coming on the on the investment side. Um, so purse and tourists is a real problem. It's going to be. You know, if, if you and I are still doing this in the mid twenty or twenties, or who, whoever's doing this in the mid twenties, it's going to be what they talk about a lot. They've already the legislatures kicked that can right square, smack dab, in the middle of the twenties and and on into the thirties. Now we come back to oil tax credits. They're proposing to do the same thing with oil tax credits. They're proposing to kick those uh, costs out of the current generation, the ones that created this mess. Uh, and kick them right into the middle uh, of the 2020s at the same time as you have these PERS and TERS costs coming up. So instead of instead of just the 15 percent, nearly 15 percent of revenues that we're going to have going to PERS and TERS, by the time you add the bonds in, we're over 20 percent uh, in FY 2024 of these sort of fixed costs uh, that are coming off off debt and debt like uh, obligations. It is we, we are we are creating a serious problem uh, for Alaskans who are going to be here in the mid 2020s, and we're justifying it on the basis of oh you know oil oil volumes will go up, oil prices will go up, well, well they always do. We'll right. be fine. We'll be fine. Um, <laughs> betting on with, the with, with betting the on the best case that. scenario. That's the, you know that's the legislature's problem, is betting on the best case scenario every time. It's it's why they factor in that eight percent return on pers and ters instead of the historical you know five or six percent return. That's why they do that, and and it's why quite honestly they've continued to underfund their pers obligation over the years because they always figured well down the road we'll have more money so we can really do it then. We really need this money for our widget program and our vitamin D study this year. We'll use it for something else next year, and uh, and that's that kind of thinking has gotten us has gotten us right to this situation. I mean, it is the spending that is taking us there, and it's what's driving everything that we're talking about. No, well, Michael, it's worse than that. It's they're they're not betting on the best case. They're betting on more than the best case. I mean, the twenty percent. Um, uh, uh, that's going to be consumed by the bonds plus uh, pers and ters in 2024. That's that's using the revenues uh, that that the Department of Revenue has forecast. So they've they've already built in their best case scenario on what volumes and prices are going to be uh, in that time frame. They're they're trying to justify this on the basis of it's going to be even better than that. But they're not forecasting. They're not forecasting the volumes. That it takes to be, or the prices that that it takes to be better than that. So, it's 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 just 
it's very wishful thinking. It's just another example of what's gotten us into this situation in the first place. Tomorrow will always turn out differently. It'll always be better. So we can afford to spend it now. Uh, or in the case, we can afford to kick the can down the road into into tomorrow. So it's, it's what's gotten Alaska into the, in the problem it's in, as we'll talk about in a second. It's what's gotten the U.S. into the problem it's in. It is, it, we are we are not thinking through the consequences tomorrow of what we're doing today. And when we try to make today a little bit better, a little bit easier, a little bit less spendy, we're just accelerating the problem that Alaskans uh, in the 2020 time frame are going are gonna to have to deal with. And yet, uh, even some of our most fiscally conservative or, or, or conscientious legislators are still wishy-washy on whether or not this is a good idea. I had a conversation with Tammy Wilson last week who said she was still undecided, and I pointed out all these things, and she's still undecided on whether or not this is a good idea. Again, even as a consumer, and again, I, I, I try and liken all this back to stuff that I can – understand or identify with, even as a consumer, understanding that I need to borrow all this money to kick all these balloon payments down the road on my house and my car and everything else, that this is very, very dangerous waters for us. Um, even then, uh, they just don't seem to understand it. I do not understand the attraction of doing this, kind, of, especially when we're, oh, which, which is another thing. Tammy made a mention of something saying that we had not fulfilled our statutory minimums um, on oh, the on Lord. the oil tax credits. Now, I uh, and inadvertently I, I agreed with her at the moment, not realizing that she was talking about. I thought she was talking about something else, but I went back and listened, and I accidentally agreed with her. Have we not paid? I had, I understood you to say earlier that we have paid all of our oil tax credits per the minimum statute required. I mean, otherwise we'd be facing lawsuits, right? Yeah, exactly right. No, we paid them. We we have we have we have complied with the statute. All the way through. Now there's a there's a proposal coming from the House essentially now to short pay this year's oil tax credits uh, based upon a new interpretation of the statute. That's bad, uh, but that's just a proposal by the House. The Senate's corrected it in their budget. Presumably, if we don't do these bonds, presumably uh, they will interpret the, the 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 conference committee dealing with the operating budget will come out with the with the right number. But but to the extent Tammy is arguing. In the past, she's wrong. We have we have complied with the statutory obligation um, every year. Yeah, it's. Uh, I just I find it hard to believe that they continue to even question whether this is a good idea or not. Again, as looking at the numbers that you're talking about and understanding it, even from a consumer standpoint of saying, let's kick all this debt down the road and be. And, and have to pay for it in 20 years in huge amounts. I mean, twenty. if I had to pay 20% of my overall income to some large debt all of a sudden out of the blue, uh, I mean, I would be in full-on scramble mode, and I would be avoiding it at all costs if that's what I could do, uh, you know, let alone my, my regular living conditions to have another 20% on top of it. It makes no sense at all. And, uh, and again, it hides the fact that what we have here – is we have a spending problem. They want to use that money now for other things. Yeah, exactly right. I, the, the only justification I've really heard that makes sense to me, sort of sense to me, is let's give a bunch of money to these oil companies, and they'll go out and do good things with it. They'll create jobs, <coughs> uh, and they'll do uh, they'll do all sorts of good things with that with that bundle of money we're going to give them now. Uh, that's sort of the justification that that a lot of Republicans seem to have bought off on. Uh, but, th- but there's two problems with that is one, that's not what the statute, that's not the, that's not the agreement we had with the oil companies back in 27, 2007 and 2008 when this program started. Um, and so we're sort of, we're, we're sort of, you know, giving them, a, we gave them a subsidy through those entire years, uh, according to the statute. And now we want to give them even a little bit more of a subsidy right. uh, to, uh, uh, to try to spur them on more. I, Right. I, I've not seen any evidence. I've not seen any evidence. I've seen a lot of arm waving and claims, but I've not seen any evidence that giving them this pot of money now is going to result in additional revenue to the state 
uh, or or have a have a payout to the state that's any better than where we're otherwise going to come to if we adhere to the current statute. People talk about jobs, but we're taking jobs out of the economy through PFD cuts. We're not we're not looking at this on an apples and apples basis. Right. But the, but the big problem big problem to me is by paying them this, a bunch of money now, which again doesn't seem to I see no evidence produces any results. Paying them a bunch of money now. What it does to the 2020 uh, uh, time frame, what it does to Alaskans in 2020s, is, is just unconscionable. So I, it, 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 to me, this is a litmus test vote, vote on fiscal conservatives. If you truly believe, if you truly believe in the principles of being fiscally conservative, then this generation pays what it, the mess it got itself into, pays it out according to the statute. And then by the 2020s, we let them deal with PERS and TERS, which we've already kicked into that time frame. If you if you if you if you're just a wishy-washy fiscal conservative, you say, oh well, you know, magic, magically, magically, we're going to get more oil out of this, and so yeah, let's just kick all these costs in the 2020s, and and we'll they'll figure it out. The combination of PERS and TERS and uh, uh, and uh, 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 the old tax credit bonds, we'll let them figure out what to do with it. It. It, it 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 is not fiscally responsible to do that. There's not a good fiscal case for. There's not a a demonstrated fiscal case for why that makes sense. The only thing it does is kicks kicks the problem down the road and lets people avoid confronting it. Now that's not the fiscally conservative thing to do. Uh, in the chat room, <clears throat> James says the legislature ignoring statute while expecting us to follow the statute is starting to look like a sick Saturday Night Live skit. And then Harold says. Rational people generally lower costs over time, which actually is a great segue into our final topic, which kind of tails into our last topic, which is, I mean, come on, we we understand that when the stuff is sick, we need to, you know, give it medicine. We need to, if we see these train wrecks are coming, we start to apply the brakes. We don't keep pouring the coal to it. And unfortunately, as I said earlier, it's monkey see, monkey do. The Alaska legislature has now fully embraced the stupidity of the federal government in this idea that we could spend whatever we want. We'll generate the revenue somewhere or borrow the money or do something. And that now is leading us to be the only country in the world. I mean, we're number one again, but now in a way that we don't want to be, we're number one in debt moving forward over the next 10, 15, 20 years. We are at a national debt level. There's all sorts of. I, I, I we publish a factoid a day on 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 the national debt. We publish one on on the PFD, the consequences of PFD cuts. We publish another one uh, on national debt. And there's all by all sorts of standards, uh, we are putting ourselves in a in a deeper world of hurt. There was a editorial uh, in the Anchorage Daily News uh, last week. Um, uh, the, the title of it is the United States is mortgage, mortgage, mortgaging its future. And that focused on a recent study by the International Monetary Fund looking at a broad range uh, of countries uh, and how they're dealing with their debt load. Every, every uh, 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 Western economy um, was is reducing their debt during this period of economic growth during this during this relatively strong economic period that we're in. They're reducing their debt levels. The United States is the only country in that entire list, the only country that is increasing its debt load, and the United States is doing it at a faster clip uh, than than most of those countries did, even when we were down in the depths uh, of the recession. The uh, uh, one one figure that came out yesterday is just staggering. We've got a 20, roughly $20 <coughs> trillion dollar debt, right? Right. Since the beginning of the Republic to right now, we've built up a roughly $20 trillion debt. In the first quarter of this year, the first fiscal quarter of this year, the first three months, the, the Treasury went out and borrowed an additional almost $500 million, $500 billion, almost a half a trillion dollars in additional debt in one quarter alone to layer on top uh, of the $20 trillion well, that we've already already yeah, got. Yeah, that was the day that, I mean, when we tripped over the $21 trillion debt mark, which was a milestone, which was so underreported, it's astonishing. The Friday before we tripped over, just the Friday, we borrowed $97 billion on a Friday, and the following five days after we tripped over a trillion, we borrowed another $300 billion after we tripped over the $21 trillion. So in just 
five or six or eight day span, we borrowed $400 billion and they're already talking about multi-trillion dollar deficits per year moving forward. One to two trillion dollars per year moving forward. Brad, I love tax cuts as much as the next guy, but what this does is that again, it masks the symptoms. It's like taking Advil for cancer. You've got a problem and the problem is an addiction to spending, and nobody wants to be the bad guy to say, we've got to stop. Yeah, it's it's exact. we're doing exactly the same thing at the federal level that you and I were just talking about at the state level with these oil and gas tax credit bonds. We're pushing the problem to the next generation. The tax cuts and the spending uh, bill that that Congress did earlier this year, the combination of those two uh, adds adds an additional uh, $1 trillion uh, to debt uh, over the next 10 years. It just pushes, we're borrowing from the future to, to, to make our, our lives better. We're par- borrowing from the next generation in order to make our lives a little bit better, but we're making theirs worse. I mean, we're taking money out of their mouths. We're taking money out of their hands uh, by, by borrowing now uh, and pushing that obligation uh, off on them. I, the, the numbers are, st- what we're doing to national debt is just staggering. We, have, we are headed toward a national debt level uh, in the next 10 years that will be higher than we've had at any time since immediately after World War II, since yeah. immediately after we paid off the obligations of World War II and we paid for the Marshall Plan to restore Europe. We will have a debt level, a national debt level that is higher uh, as a percentage of, of, of GDP, percentage of, of gross domestic product, higher than at any time um, since World War uh, Two, it's going it, 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 to the the national debt level held by the public is currently about seventy seven percent of the GDP. It was roughly thirty five percent in two thousand seven. It's going to be over a hundred percent by twenty twenty eight at the at the rate we're going. It's just it's staggering, and and the implications of that. I saw a, a number today that I put in the. Uh, PDF, uh, PF, uh, excuse me, the fix the fix the debt uh, factoid for today. Yeah, uh, three hundred. Uh, the implications of that for families is just staggering. A three hundred thousand dollar home loan taken out today by a typical American family will will be will be the the cost of that over the over the life of that mortgage will be forty five thousand dollars higher for that family as a result of the interest increases. In, increase in interest rates is going to be caused by the level of national debt uh, and and the financing that we're going to be trying to do uh, uh, over the course of the next 10 years with all these deficits. $45,000, the mortgage is going to be, the cost of the mortgage is going to be $45,000 over the life of the mortgage, higher to that typical family as a result of the national debt. And there's just all sorts of statistics about how, about what we're doing to ourselves. This generation has gone berserk in terms of trying to make their lives better at the expense of future generations, just like um, uh, the, the legislature, considering these all tax bonds, is, is trying to make Alaskans' lives better at the expense of, of those in 2020. Tammy Wilson would no more uh, 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 agree with you know the the what we're doing at a national level in terms of additional debt and in terms of what we're doing uh, to the debt levels for the next generation. She would no more agree to that than the man on the moon. Yet, if she if she votes for uh, uh, for these for HB 331, these old tax bonds, she's doing the same thing at the state level. It we 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 have got to get this under control. Not only at the state level, we've got to get it under control at the national level. Well, and I think, you know, this doesn't even take into account uh, some other factors, which I've touched on in the show in the past, and you and I really haven't discussed, but things like the change in the petrodollar now to the potential challenge of the petro yuan, inflationary measures and things if the United States dollar stops becoming the uh, stops being the world reserve currency, and many other factors which could cause inflation to go berserk. Uh, I mean, there are things out there that that uh, are truly scary from a fiscal standpoint for the United States. As you point out, personal debt in the United States is already we got two thirds of the people in the country living at 120 percent of their income level every year. I mean, these are terrifying numbers. And, And again, it's monkey see, monkey do. We have got to get a grip on this or 
there will be a reckoning and it is not a reckoning that we i mean it will make you know it will make zimbabwe and weimar germany look like a walk in the park if it's all said and done but nobody seems to be learning those lessons yeah you know people people respond to that saying well that's just that's too that's too pessimistic um but you look at these numbers i mean we've never tried this before we we we've, we've done higher wire acts in this country uh, before in terms of debt levels and in terms of interest costs, but we've never done this before. We're now talking about interest costs that will exceed in the next 10 years. We're talking about interest costs that will rise to a level. This is, this is dead money. This is money that we're paying on debt that we've already issued. We're not getting any bigger bang for the buck. It's, it's interest. It's largely going a, a big chunk of it's going to foreign governments, including the Chinese who hold our debt. The interest costs alone in the next 10 years will be uh, greater than defense spending uh, and greater than discretionary uh, uh, domestic spending. Right. We're talking about huge, <clears throat> huge numbers. We're going to we're going to yeah, yes. we're, we're going to match the defense spending in 5 years. 2023 is what the CBO says. 2023 we'll be spending more on interest than our entire military budget. And this is not like we spent it on an infrastructure project that pays back over the course of decades. You know, we're not building dams and roads and highways. We are paying down debt on widgets that we already bought. Yeah. So it's a, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a huge problem looming ahead of us. Sometimes we in Alaska think, well, what can we do about it? I mean, we're just, we're, you know, you and I are just sitting here, uh, two, two guys sitting in, in, uh, in, in South Central Alaska. What can we do about it? The Alaska delegation, the Alaska delegation, congressional delegation actually plays a fairly central role in this. Uh, Senator Murkowski sits on Senate appropriations. Which is which is the committee that decides spending levels, uh, and Dan uh, Sullivan sits on Senate uh, Armed Services, which is driving the military budget. And the military budget, frankly, is part of the problem here. Uh, they are well positioned uh, to play roles in trying to get this problem under control. I my my hope is they will start talking about the problem. When you look at the press releases from Sullivan and the pr- press releases from Murkowski, they very seldom mention this issue. Both of them voted for the tax cuts that are a part of the problem. Uh, Murkowski voted for the final spending bill, and both Murkowski and Sullivan voted for the preliminary spending bill that that made the problem even worse. Um, they really, I mean, they're they're thus far they aren't dealing with it, uh, but but hopefully they play a key role in it, and hopefully. Uh, through conversations like this and other conversations in Alaska, we can begin to get them engaged in being part of the solution as, instead of part of the problem. Well, <clears throat> we've got to do it. And I think we, again, uh, as I've often said, we have to take this a step at a time. We have to, you know, fix it at our, we have to fix ourselves first, then our cities, then our boroughs, then our state. And then maybe, just maybe, if we do that, if we get ourselves right, we can help get the national level right. Uh, but until we do that, you know, get out of debt, stop spending more than we earn, convincing our cities and our boroughs to do the same, to be responsible with their spending, to stop taxing people out of prosperity, uh, then then we can maybe have a shot at fixing the national stuff. But until then, again, it's just monkey see, monkey do, and that is, I think, the crisis, the tipping point for everything that we're talking about right now. Final thoughts, Brad Keithley. Well, I mean, I, I like your change, your your principles of change. We got to change the players. I mean, we're 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 into this situation because of the players we've got, uh, and we've got to change the players in order to to change the outcome. If we don't change the players, um, then we're going to be into the into the late ni- the 2019s or the late 20 teens and the early 2020s, and this problem is going to be going deeper and deeper and deeper. And just like now, just like now, where we're saying, oh, God, we could have con- corrected this. If we could just go back to 2012, we'd do it differently. We wouldn't be in this shape. We wouldn't have to cut the PFD. Boy, if we'd only just seen it back then. Well, we're seeing it right now. So change the players, get it under control. Or we're going to be talking about this even deeper from the from the from the from the hole uh, in the early 2020s. 
Brad Keithley is with Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget. You can find him on Facebook. I've posted links to the various news articles we've talked about today on the program inside the chat on Facebook. You can find it there and, of course, subscribe to his uh, Facebook page to get his daily updates as well. Brad, thanks so much for coming on and joining us. Appreciate you being part of the Michael Duke Show today. Michael, thanks as always for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three. Goodbye.